wanted to follow up uh, Dr. Webster's talk, talking uh, about nanomedicine in honor of the, of the great work that he's done, but in a bit of a different arena, the intestinal mucosal interface. Um, so I first became interested in, in what's happening in the intestine, um, and that's where the bulk of the work in my lab is now, when I was working at Pfizer as a, as a formulation scientist for a few years before joining academia. Um, I, I knew I wanted to work in drug delivery. I had done tissue engineering as a grad student. I, I wanted that kind of experience. I knew I wanted to work in industry, but to be honest with you, I was a little disappointed when my best offer, for various reasons, ended up being in the area of oral drug delivery. Um, I had this idea. I knew that, that people were doing oral drug delivery of proteins and other biological molecules, and I think Dr. Pepis is here, and he's, he's made great strides in that area, as well as people like Samirmi Trigotri, for example. Um, but I was going to be doing oral drug delivery of small molecular weight compounds, so things that have a molecular weight less than about 500 Daltons. And I had in my mind this idea that there just wasn't all that much interesting science. It wasn't that exciting. Um, but what I quickly found out is there's actually quite a bit of interesting science, and oral drug delivery in particular is very exciting from the point of view of pharmaceutical companies. Um, just from a marketing point of view, because of patient convenience and compliance, if you can deliver a drug orally, that's what they want to do. But it turns out, um, as we heard actually in Dr. Granger's talk the other day, that even for small molecular weight compounds, oral delivery isn't possible for about 70% of the compounds coming out of discovery pipelines. And that's because they're very hydrophobic, they have low aqueous solubility, and they essentially don't go into solution enough in your GI tract to pass across the intestinal membrane. Now luckily there's a number of different technologies that have been developed to overcome these challenges, many of them nanotechnologies. We heard in Dr. Granger's talk about the fact that there's multiple marketed products which simply utilize the fact that if you reduce the drug product size to the nanoscale range because of increased surface area, increased surface energy, you can drive more drug into solution in the GI tract. Um, I became interested in another type of nanotechnology when I was working at Pfizer lipid-based drug delivery systems. These are often called self-emulsifying drug delivery systems. They, they tend to contain a drug together with lipid and surfactant. And the reason that they're called self-emulsifying drug delivery systems or SEDS is because when you ingest them, they actually naturally form in the mixed environment in the GI tract emulsions, which are stabilized um, by these surfactants. So I was really fascinated with these systems. Let me see if I can do the, uh-oh. There we go. I was really fascinated um, with these systems because what I found in talking to my colleagues and in looking in the literature is they can really have a really profound impact on bioavailability. So we see here a pharmacokinetic profile, which is just drug concentration in the blood after oral dosing. And we see we can see these really, really big improvements in bioavailability for certain compounds and certain formulations, whereas others you don't see such an improvement in bioavailability, and sometimes you can even see a reduction. Um, and talking to colleagues about why, about why we weren't employing these types of technologies with formulations we were developing, I was told, well, you know, we don't really know when they're going to work, right? We don't really know for which drugs they were going to work. We don't know how to design these formulations. As an, as an engineer and somebody who's fascinated with design, um, that got me to thinking about, you know, as a challenge, you know, can we figure out how to rationally design these systems? So. I'll talk a little bit about work we've done in that area in a second, but I just want to also mention that along the way, we've also become really interested in how the food that we eat impacts the way our body absorbs different compounds. And this is actually a really parallel and related issue um, because one of the major components in food that impacts the way your, your body will absorb drugs as well as other compounds, even nutrients, is the lipid content. And like with lipid-based drug delivery systems, food can have a really profound impact on bioavailability of certain compounds, improving it significantly, whereas with other compounds you can actually see no effect but also a reduction in bioavailability with food. And this is an important effect to be able to predict. I should mention right now it's not something that's quantitatively predictable a priori. Um, but if we could predict this type of effect and exploit it, we could reduce oral dosages of compounds that have really bad local GI side effects and are very costly, like oral chemotherapeutic compounds, for example. Um, and we could possibly even enable oral delivery of compounds that otherwise require injection. So this got us um, thinking, can we predict, can we design lipid-based systems and predict the impact that they're going to have on bioavailability or pharmacokinetic profiles? And in thinking about this, you have to start to think about what's actually happening in the GI tract after you orally ingest something that results in the concentration of drug that ends up being in your blood. 
And how is that then impacted in the presence of lipids, either from drug delivery systems or for the foods that you eat? And the approach that we've taken in our lab is to basically think about what's happening in the GI tract as a system. Um, and so, for example, if you take the case of dosing a drug together with lipids, like you would with, with food, for example, and this is as opposed to in a drug delivery system where the drug would already be pre-dissolved in the lipid, in the, in the emulsified drug delivery system, um, there's a series of different processes which are occurring in your GI tract, which ultimately are resulting in the concentration of absorbed drug or concentration of drug in the blood. And we've studied these different processes in the lab. We try to quantify them and then uh, develop models to predict, to pre predict their function. Um, so the approach that we've taken is to study sort of broad ranges of drug delivery systems, broad ranges, for example, including lipids, triglycerides with different fatty acid chain lengths, different surfactants that have different hydrophilic, lipophilic balances, and looking at combining them in different ratios so that we have broad ranges of formulations that vary, for example, in particle size, as reflected here in their turbidity, and also in, the, in their function. And we study different aspects of this complex dynamic environment, and because it is a complex dynamic environment, we need to understand how are things changing over time. So if we take one example of, for example, trying to understand what's happening to mice cells in this environment. So in your GI tract, you naturally have biomice cells, and what happens is as lipids are digested, lipid digestion products like fatty acids and monoglycerides are partitioning into those mice cells. And that's important in the systems that we study because what that results in is a change in the size and essentially the, the volume that's available of, in these mice cells for drug to then partition into. So it's changing the drug concentration in our system. And we've been able to study that, for example, with collaborators using small angle neutron scattering or SANS. Similarly, you have a number of different processes that are occurring like partitioning. And it's important to kind of understand if drug is partitioning into different phases in this system, influencing that free drug concentration that's driving absorption, you know, what are the kinetics of these different processes that are occurring? So if we focus, for example, on just partitioning into a lipid emulsion droplet, it's really challenging to study um, because you need to be able to quantify where the drug is. So one approach we've taken is using a spectroscopic technique called electron paramagnetic resonance. And what, what EPR, or electron paramagnetic resonance, allows you to do is to look at a spectrum of a given molecule and to, to extract parameters that describe the microenvironment of that molecule. Um, the caveat of this technique is that it requires the molecule that, of interest to have an unpaired electron. And most drug molecules that we're interested in do not have unpaired electrons. So we use EPR probes, which have similar size and log p values, hydrophobicity values, as typical drug molecules um, to study partitioning. So here you can see, for example, if you have a drug molecule in the presence of emulsions and micelles, we can see over time the partitioning of drug into an emulsion droplet, and that results in a change in this spectrum. And we can actually deconvolute the spectrum so that we can quantify how much drug over time is in an aqueous environment versus in micelles versus in emulsion droplets. And then we can quantify these different processes and model them. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to put this all together. So we're essentially studying different processes that are occurring in the GI tract, like lipid digestion, like dissolution. We're, we're using relatively simple kinetic expressions, mass transport expressions to describe them. And what we're showing is that it's really important to take into account these concurrent processes. So for example, if you were to model the concentration of drug, which is free, that, that important free drug concentration or activity, which drives absorption, um, in a static system that didn't take into account the fact that you have a changing environment and digestion occurring, um, you would predict a very different and, and measure a very different drug concentration from what you have if you actually take into account this dynamic system. So you can start to get a feel for why it's important to, to model and understand these systems. So what we're starting to do is put this all together um, into sort of very simple systems-based models that predict drug absorption, seeing can we actually predict these pharmacokinetic profiles, um, both in animals as well as with human data. So I want to, oh, I should mention where, where we want to go with this. So I'm very interested in food, as I already mentioned, um, and I'm kind of very interested in how this whole system might change. Um, if, you, if you were comparing, for example, a lipid that's more um, common in, in Western diets, for example, versus um, more traditional diets. 
So I just want to uh, change, change direction here a little bit and tell you about sort of a different sort of significant area of, of nanomedicine in the, in, in the GI tract. Um, so we study mucus. And um, some of you may be wondering right now, like, you know, why are you interested in mucus? Well, I was originally interested in mucus as sort of part of this system, trying to understand how much of a barrier is it to drug delivery, both in terms of particulate systems, like nanoparticles that people might deliver orally, but also molecular species. Um, but just to tell you a little bit more about mucus and why we should all care very much about it, it's essentially, it's a natural hydrogel, it's a, it's a nanostructured material. It lines all of the, the wet epithelial surfaces of your body, really forming the first barrier between you and the outside world. Um, the, the mucus in your nasal passage is actually required for a proper sense of smell. It controls fertilization. And importantly, in the GI tract, if we look at the intestinal epithelium, the mucus layer here stained in green is really important but in, in terms of modifying the interactions between the tissues in the gut and the gut luminal contents. And here you can see, for example, microbes which are stained red and the mucus controlling the interactions between those tissues and the microbes in your microbiome. So I mentioned already you know, that we're, we're really interested in the barrier properties of mucus. So how does mucus, this natural hydrogel, provide these important barrier properties? If we look at its structural features and sort of zoom in on mucus, you can start to get a feel for this nanoporous structure. It has a pore size nominally of about 50 to 100 nanometers. Um, you can see that also just looking at a cross section. These are the intestinal microvilli right here. This is the, the mucus structure. And you can kind of see this tortuous network which makes up mucus. So when you think about how it provides a barrier, obviously there's physical features to this barrier. If you're thinking about a, a nanoparticle and, and, and a nanoparticle diffusing through this barrier, for example, as well as molecular interactions which species will undergo as they travel through this porous network. So we've utilized a technique um, called multiple particle tracking to try to characterize mucus barrier properties and how significant those barrier properties are for different types of drug carriers. Um, and basically what you do in multiple particle tracking is you use fluorescently tagged nanoparticles, and these nanoparticles can be thought of as model drug carriers and also probes of the local environment. And we study their motion by, by basically looking at their trajectories using uh, analysis of, of videos with video microscopy. And then we extract from those trajectories quantitative parameters that describe the barrier properties of the mucus, like mean square displacement of the particles and their effective diffusivity. And what we found um, through a whole series of studies, essentially, um, is that the, the mucus barrier um, can provide a very significant uh, barrier to, to nanoparticle transport. So for example, um, if you look at the, the type of motion you measure for different particles, and you look at the effective diffusivities you'll measure for different particles through mucus, um, what you'll find is, is that you can predict roughly the, the amount of time it would take to traverse the mucosal barrier, and you find that it's on the same order as the turnover rate of mucus in the intestine, which is several hours. So just sort of a fun fact, our bodies are all producing about a liter of mucus a day. It's a huge, huge energy investment for your body. So it kind of talks about how important um, this hydrogel is. So, so the fact that, that these two things are occurring on a same order of magnitude time scale tells us it is really important if you're designing a nanoparticle system, for example, to think about its features. Um, and some of the sort of obvious features you think about are size, surface chemistry. Um, in particular, the mucus gel is, is highly negatively charged. Its main structural component is mucin, a large glycoprotein, which has negatively charged sugars on it. Um, so as you might expect, if you start looking at the effect of surface charge and more positively charged particles, they're much more significantly hindered in their transport through mucus compared to more negatively charged particles. One thing that we found, um, which we think is particularly interesting, is that it appears that this natural barrier in your GI tract is actually modulated by relatively mild stimuli that we expose it to every day. Um, for example, lipids, which would be present in food that we eat. So if you look here, again, looking at mean square displacement and this effective diffusivity, you can see um, particles which have uh, different surface chemistries, different sizes, and sort of the size sensitivity of this barrier, um, something that we've studied um, quite extensively, actually, in collaboration with Merck, um, because they're interested in developing these, these nanoscale drug particles to, to enhance oral delivery. Um, and what we see is that if we compare these dashed lines, where the, the particles have been dosed to mucus in a, in a, in a fluid simulating fed state intestinal contents, and we see drastically reduced transport of particles and sort of increased size selectivity 
of this mucus gel, which we think is um, really important, not only for the point of view of understanding drug delivery, but even just understanding physiological function in terms of is this sort of your body's sort of natural way perhaps from protecting you from particulate materials that you might ingest, or maybe enhancing absorption by, enhan by entrapping particulate material in the mucosal gel. Um, something that's, that's particularly interesting is that it appears that these effects of changing the, the, the barrier properties of mucus gels are significant not only to passively diffusing things like particles, but also microbes. So we've actually, if you look over here, you can see that the trajectories of microbes swimming in mucus when they've been exposed to the mucus again in just a buffer versus what would be a model fed state intestinal content. And we can see a significant reduction in the velocity of those microbes as they swim through the mucus. So we've, tried to, we've started to try to think about how could we potentially exploit these effects and, and what other types of things that we, that we might ingest might have these effects. Can we use these effects to enhance drug delivery or maybe to prevent infection, for example? Um, so we've been looking at um, different types of agents which people have noted are, are, are strengthening um, agents in terms of enhancing the protective barrier of the intestinal mucosa. And one thing that we found um, has some really striking effects is lysozyme. Lysozyme is present in egg whites. It's also present in relatively high concentrations in breast milk. And what we've seen is that, if you, again, if you look at particles with different surface functionalities, and you will hear, note here the pegylated particles. <laughs> Actually, Justin Haynes at, from Johns Hopkins has done some really beautiful work um, showing the significance of pegylation and enabling particles to, to very quickly traverse mucosal barriers. Um, but if we look at different surface functionalizations on particles, we see for all these particles, again, dramatic reductions in their abilities to diffuse through mucosal barriers if we expose them in the presence of lysozyme. And we think that that has something to do with sort of cro enhanced cross-linking of the network. You can see here red lectin-stained mucus with green nanoparticles and see that they end up being kind of entrapped um, right where you sort of expose the nanoparticles to the mucus in the presence of lysine versus evenly distributed in the sense of, a, of just a buffer. Um, similarly, it appears that um, agents which are used in drug delivery systems, even present in food, like emulsifiers, which are, are used in drug delivery, but even present in processed foods, seem to dramatically change uh, the barrier properties of the, the mucosal barrier in our guts, which again is kind of very interesting, both from the point of view of what it might mean for drug delivery, again, looking at nanoparticles with different surface functionalities, um, but also from the point of view of thinking, and, and we can see structural features of the mucus by electron microscopy with exposure to these emulsifiers, but also from the point of view, again, of understanding microbial motion and our interactions with our microbiome and our gut and how they might be modulated by things that we ingest, either in drug delivery systems or in our food. Um, so you see here, for example, um, two emulsifiers which are commonly used in drug delivery systems as well as food, and you can see bacteria swimming in mucus um, in the presence of just a, a buffer, uh, actually, I'm sorry, this is the swimming in a buffer in the presence of these um, different emulsifiers or, or just swimming in mucus in the presence of the different emulsifiers. And, and sort of the take home message is that we see a significant impact of the emulsifiers on, on the microbe ability to swim um, through mucus, which is pretty interesting. So just to wrap up, I hope I've given you sort of a, a couple of interesting stories um, about how nanomedicine is really significant at the intestinal mucosal barrier. Um, we're, we're continuing exploring these different effects and if they can be exploited, as I, as I mentioned, and, and developing sort of tissue engineered model guts where we can, we can study them a little bit more carefully. So I'd just like to thank you all so much for your attention. Thank Tom again for this wonderful opportunity to be here and speak with you. And of course, um, wonderful collaborators and, and funding. Fascinating stuff from this. Yeah.